on camera. Today is September 5th, 2018, and my name is Tony Hilliard. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center, and with me is Sue Verhoff, the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the History Center here in Atlanta. We're, we are at the History Center today to record the oral history of a friend of mine, Mr. William J. Davis, Bill Davis, who served in the U.S. Marine Corps during the Vietnam War. Mr. Davis's oral history is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. We're honored to have you with us today, Bill, and thanks for participating in the project. Would you begin by telling us your full name and where you live? William Jennings Davis. Uh, my wife and I uh, reside in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, spent 30 years in the Marine Corps. Uh, basically, to start the story, uh, I was born and raised in uh, Mount Shasta area of California, a little town called Weed, California, which was a, a lumber and ranching community. Uh, my, my mother actually was from Georgia. Uh, she was born and raised and grew up in South Georgia in a small town called Dorn, Georgia. Uh, the family basically had uh, kind of uh, originated with my, my grandfather, uh, grew up in Plains. Uh, his father was born in Edgefield, South Carolina, and then moved to Georgia. Uh, my uh, grandmother, so the, my people basically were uh, on my mother's side, mainly from South Carolina and, uh, and Georgia. Uh, my mother uh, married my father in 1939. Uh, they moved to California where my dad uh, resided and the whole family was from. Uh, I was born October the 20th, 1943. I grew up in this small town. Uh, very about 3,500 people. The uh, the main thing was as soon as I got out of high school, it was to escape the confines of weed and to go go to college. I uh, graduated uh, in 1966 from California State University at Sacramento with a bachelor's degree in history. Uh, I had joined the Marine Corps in 1965 through the Platoon Leaders Class program. Uh, would go that summer of 1965 to Quantico for 10 weeks of officer candidate training uh, 1966 and then upon graduation uh, from uh, California State uh, Sacramento was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps Reserve went to Quantico to basic the basic school for basic uh, training as a as a marine officer uh, at Quantico, the training was primarily uh, to develop platoon commanders, platoon leaders, with a background in infantry tactics, weapons, leadership uh, that would, of all things, uphold that tradition of the Marine Corps that every Marine officer was basically, and every Marine are basically riflemen first, whatever their uh, specialty MOS might be. Were you uh, married at the time? Yes. Janice Weber Davis uh, from Sanger, California, and I were married April the 2nd, 1966. Uh, so we came together. Uh, first time living together as man and wife, uh, came to Quantico. So Janice basically uh, grew up with me in the Marine Corps. Um, at, uh, when I finished basic school, uh, I had selected uh, to try to be a tanker, an, an 1802 numerical MOS designator, uh, was then assigned to go to uh, 2nd Tank Battalion located at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Uh, after reporting to 2nd Tanks, uh, went to Fort Knox to the Army Armor School that was then located at Fort Knox, uh, went through the Armor Officer Basic Training to become a basic trained tank or armor officer, reported back to uh, 2nd Tank Battalion. Um, at that time, I, when I reported back to 2nd Tanks, was given two choices as the day I reported in. It was said, we're going to send you to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba with heavy tanks, M103, 120 uh, millimeter gun tank. Um, went home and told my wife and then Peggy and Hilliard and Tony Hilliard, who were also at Camp Lejeune, uh, that I was going to Cuba. The next day I walked in and the battalion commander called for me to come up to the office and said, you're not going to Cuba, you're now going 
on the ready uh, batta battalion landing team float in the Mediterranean for six months, came home and had to tell my wife, who was then pregnant with our son, that I was not going to be there for the birth of our son, but rather I was going to be on a Mediterranean cruise, which sounds luxurious. It was not. I was on a gray Navy ship called the USS San Marcos LSD-25 for a period of six months, and we were the uh, the Marine Corps used to have a, a reinforced infantry battalion with tanks and Amtraks and engineers and the other support that would go with a battalion landing team uh, that was assigned to be the rapid reaction force in the Mediterranean if Marine forces were needed. Uh, six month cruise came back to the 2nd Tank Battalion, uh, was then advised like all Marines, it was my turn, I was going to Vietnam. Uh, but on the way, I stopped at Fort Gordon, Georgia. Janice and I both stopped, and William, our son, uh, stopped at Fort Gordon, Georgia for the Army Civil Affairs and Military Government School. The Marine Corps had a quota. We had to go fill this quota, as Tony knows, because he filled the same quota about one or two classes ahead of me. Um, we then uh, we went back to California, um, leave before going overseas was then um, I, Janice stayed in Sanger with William, our son, um, also taught school when that year that I was gone to, to Vietnam. Um, when then uh, went to um, uh, Travis uh, Air Force Base, got on a military flight, then flew to Okinawa where the uh, you were to go through initial briefings and outfitting and then would uh, later on, after about four or five days, would go into Vietnam. Uh, when we landed uh, at Okinawa, at Kadena Air Force Base, uh, a representative said, I want all the infantry officers, tank officers, and artillery officers to gather it over here. And he then said, there's an urgent need for the three of you and your MOSs to get to Vietnam faster than the normal. Uh, and so Tomorrow morning, you be back here at, uh, I think it was 7.30, sometime uh, for, to catch a C-130 that's going to fly you directly to Da Nang. What year uh, was that? That was 1968. Uh, 1968, as you know, was a, a, a pretty heavy year in terms of uh, combat operations that were ongoing within Vietnam, and the uh, those three combat arms uh, where they needed replacements. Um, and so went in, did all the signing of the paperwork, putting my uh, uniforms in storage, uh, and then be, I think I was issued, as I remember, I was issued uh, boots, camouflage utilities for Vietnam. Um, we then reported the next morning, uh, got on a C-130, were flown to Da Nang. Uh, as we landed in Da Nang, we were then uh, divided into two groups, those going to 3rd Marine Division, which was up near the DMZ, those in 1st Marine Division, which was around the Da Nang, Chulai area. Uh, we then grabbed on another C-130 and flew to Dong Ha, uh, which was south of the uh, DMZ, uh, was a, a large containment area for uh, Marine forces, Marine units assigned to the 3rd Marine Division. Uh, the headquarters was actually in the Quang Tree Combat Base, which was south of, Dana of Dong Ha. Um, as we arrived, it was getting late in the day, and this uh, young Lance Corporal said, uh, when I asked, we, at we asked, there were about six or seven lieutenants that were waiting to go down to uh, ch check in with the division headquarters. Where, where do we go? Where's, where do we sleep? till we go down there, and they said, go find yourself a cot someplace. And so we found one across the uh, the road from uh, the, the main air uh, containment area because one of the other lieutenants uh, who was a Mustang or an enlisted Marine that had been commissioned knew somebody that knew where we could find a place to sleep. Uh, so that was my introduction to Vietnam. Uh, next morning, we found a, uh, a ride, got down to division headquarters, uh, checked in. I was assigned to 3rd Tank Battalion because I was, at that time, I was the first lieutenant 
if the majority of second lieutenants at that time in 1968, if they re when they reported in, regardless of MOS, if they would be assigned for about a, th a three month uh, term term of duty tour of duty with the infantry forces, but if you were a, a first lieutenant and above, then you would go to tank battalion. Uh, went to tank battalion was assigned then to Bravo Company, 3rd Tank Battalion, which was located uh, at that time in July of 1968 at Camp Carroll, which uh, was south of the DMC and uh, inland from the coast uh, up on a plateau, it was probably the largest uh, fire support base uh, in that northern part of I Corps near the DMC, had both Marine and artillery. Uh, it was the regimental headquarters for the 3rd Marines and Bravo Company 3rd Tanks was traditionally one that would support uh, 3rd Marine Regiment. Uh, checked in to uh, the next day uh, after arriving, uh, rode up to uh, Camp Carroll, checked in, and then uh, was a platoon commander and a company and company executive officers a dual responsibility for uh, Bravo Company 3rd Tanks. I stayed there from, uh, I guess, uh, July through about December, and uh, November, no, uh, Camp Carroll was uh, dismantled, uh, and we transferred to a, uh, a small area called Vendai, which was halfway between Camlo and Dong Ha. Uh, we were there with uh, a Navy CB uh, construction battalion an army duster, they were a, a twin 40 millimeter, uh, really started out as an anti-aircraft weapon and it was mounted on an M41 tank chassis and you had these twin 40 millimeter guns that uh, could pour out a, a pretty high rate of fire and so it was used in a ground roll or in a, uh, indirect, not so much indirect fire roll, but in a ground roll uh, along with tanks. Uh, that was an Army uh, battery that was um, uh, assigned there, then Bravo Company 3rd Tanks and the CBs. When we first got there, it was uh, MCB-22, which was a, a reserve CB unit from Texas, Oklahoma, the Southwest. And uh, we were there with them until, uh, I, and I'll talk about it a little bit, we went back later, I went back later to be the commanding officer of B Company. But in November, when I went back to battalion, I became the S3, the intelligence officer, the S3 Alpha, the operation, assistant operations officer, and then the S5, which was the civil affairs officer. And our main function was working with the Chu Hoi village that was located in Quang Tree City, uh, as well as the Kit Carson Scout Program in Quang Tree. Chu Hoi were, uh, the former North Vietnamese or Viet Cong uh, fighters or political um, officers that uh, would rally to the side, go to over to the side of the South Vietnamese government um, and were then, uh, if it appeared that they had the, uh, some, uh, they, if they were tactical or had been in a tactical unit, they would go into a program known as the Kit Carson Scout programs that they were then, after a period of training, would be assigned to uh, American or allied uh, units to be guides or to uh, help identify the area that they may have operated in, that we were currently operating in, and they would know how the other side would move, where they would uh, have things, usually caches of equipment and weapons uh, located and the tactics that might be employed against U.S. forces. Uh, Kit Cart, the Chu Hoi village, there was a center in Quang Tree City. Quang Tree was uh, a provincial headquarters, um, was, had a, 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 an old citadel wall uh, in the center of the city. Um, the Chu Hoi village, or the Chu Hoi uh, center, was where you would have the, the local Chu Hoi chief was located there, a training area, training center, an area when uh, the initially uh, the Chu Hoi's would, were coming back to the side of the government, uh, would go through an indoctrination or evaluation program. 
And then outside of Queen Tree City, there was a Chu Hoi village where if they were local Viet Cong, former Viet Cong, they would bring their families to this village and the village itself would be uh, responsible for its defense. Uh, we, the 3rd Tank Battalion had been heavily involved in civic action or civil affairs events the entire time that they were in country in Vietnam, both the Chu Loi, where the, the battalion first deployed, and then later uh, when it would move up north to Quang Tri, Dong Ha, and that area near the DMZ. Um, I think it was, a, it was a good program that um, my experience that it was extremely effective uh, and it provided a, a source of good information through the, the Kid Carson Scout program and it also was, I think, the tactic if we would have done more of that uh, could have been much more effective in terms of the eventual outcome. Uh, of May, one, we, we needed to make the foster these seeds of uh, self-reliance, democracy, uh, some degree of uh, control of your own destiny and future more than we did. Um, in the, I guess, the changing uh, during this period, the initial period, uh, as far as uh, combat operations, we were responsible uh, not only to support uh, 3rd Marine Regiment, Infantry Regiment, but on other occasions would uh, go from an area from the coast up to uh, a, a, the most forward uh, fire support base called Kantian, which was right south of the DMZ, uh, out to Chulai, or uh, Cam, um, Vandergriff Combat Base, um, and Chulai, which was a, a area where the uh, 9th Marine Regiment was located. Um, so we would provide uh, support for infantry operations in the coastal lowlands that you had fairly good mobility. Uh, as you got past the resettlement villa in Cam Lo, you started getting into a uh, more of a, a hilly and then a very heavy uh, forested uh, jungle terrain that you could not move tanks in. In those occasions, what we would do is primarily would ramp the tanks and then use them in an indirect fire mode uh, to provide uh, fire from the 90 millimeter gun that was on the tanks. Uh, other things were uh, you'd run uh, either sections or a platoon in road sweeps as the engineer would go out and, and uh, sweep the road and he had the tanks to provide support in case something would happen. Uh, we also, uh, on a number of occasions, uh, were working with the South Vietnamese uh, First uh, Infantry Division, which was probably, I think most historians now have said, was probably one of the best uh, divisions that the South Vietnamese Army had during uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, their headquarters was in a place, uh, GON, uh, and then the uh, Dong Ha area. And um, on a number of occasions, we would be assigned to provide uh, tank support to the, the Arvin. Uh, we did it more later in the story uh, when I was company commander, but I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the, a number of operations that we would take place, uh, take part in, uh, both from uh, the area near Cam Lo, uh, providing a cordon for a search operation, uh, there was another area called Mylock, which was south down the hill from Camp Carroll that we would take uh, and did on a number of occasions tanks to work with Marine forces that were sweeping in the area that would go eventually into the Quang Tree Combat Base and behind uh, the, the area where there was a, an awful lot of activity. Uh, the majority of other activity, uh, which was you from platoon size to battalion size some in some occasions would be in the Leatherneck Square area which was that area that was bounded uh, by GLN near the coast, Kantian at, at the very northern part of the AO uh, area of operations out then to uh, Kalu Vandergriff Combat Base and then down around Dong Ha and that area that was really a uh, uh, a lowland plain, uh, some rolling hills, uh, pretty good mobility for all types of vehicles and especially with tanks so you would be able to au augment uh, infantry forces and provide 
uh, direct fire support during operations, which we did uh, on, on a continual basis. Um, we, in, in, uh, during this time in, in both Contian and then Camp Carroll, were in artillery range of the North Vietnamese, which would uh, fire long-range artillery uh, at, the, at the fire support bases, and that was a, a daily and nightly occurrence. Uh, when I went back then um, to battalion following uh, that first uh, time with Company B, uh, and working then with the, uh, the intel and the other jobs. Uh, I was there until um, March, and then in March I went back to uh, March of 1969, went back as the, as the uh, commanding officer of B Company 3rd Tanks at Vendai. Uh, we at that time would work in conjunction with Bravo Company and Alpha Company 3rd Tanks, and we would trade for a, a period of time, probably about a month or so, we'd have one company that would operate in that area between Contian, Dong Ha, Camlo, and GLN, and the other would be out more of the Vandergriff Combat Base at the far um, western edge of the uh, area of operations. Uh, during that time, um, we we did a number of operations uh, the Viet, if you're working, the Vietnamese classified their operations by the word Lam San and then a number. And so uh, there were about four, uh, three or four Lam San operations that I participated in uh, that ranged from um, search and destroy missions uh, to ones that uh, we were, uh, I got a phone call one day that said uh, we were at, at Vandegriff and there was a very large operation that was taking place in the area just south of Contien. And uh, the message was received about, one, I guess, one in the afternoon to take the company. There were about 12 tanks and make an, a, a road march that would take most of the afternoon and part of the night to go up to Contien to reinforce. Uh, and they have two tank companies along with about three infantry battalions to look at an area that was tr going to try to get in to put a blocking for a, p a potential or a threat that was seen as having a, a Vietnamese r a regiment coming south. Uh, we got up there, I guess it was about 9 o'clock at night. Um, we had uh, had this road march, uh, getting there as fast as we can, and uh, uh, one portion, it finally came to the point that uh, the blackout lights were not working very well, and so I made a decision was turn on the lights and go as fast as you can, and that's what we did. And we uh, we got there. Uh, the regiment did not come south, but we did some uh, searches in the area, found minor uh, resistance, minor uh, actions, but nothing huge like they were anticipating. Um, the other operations uh, were primarily uh, others, again, reinforcing the 1st Arvin Division. Uh, where, So I guess my opinion, um, I worked with uh, a number of South Vietnamese units. And the units were usually from the 4th Battalion of the 2nd Arvin Regiment, which was one of the regiments in the 1st Division. Uh, I found them... Uh, it a direct factor of who, who was the commanding officer of, of that company because usually I'd have my, inf my tank company uh, with about 12 to 15 tanks working with a, uh, a Arvin or Army of the Republic of Vietnam uh, infantry battalion, a company, and our mission uh, in the two major operations that we had was on a very, the, the, the order of the briefing said, We're, you're going to be here we want you to go this way until you find somebody. And when you find them, you will lock them in, in and we will reinforce you and pile on and give you whatever fire support you need to destroy that force. Um, and that's what we did. Um, I guess uh, as, as we came then closer, um, we had one other operation that was uh, interesting. It, it was one of those where someone in MACV and Saigon came up with the idea that we should try a the massive deception operation with an operation called Caddo Creek that 
C A D D O C R E E K E, uh, uh, that we would have this great deception operation that would put uh, teams at various points along uh, the route that would go back towards Quezon. Uh, we would have then a tank company and an infantry company, three 105 um, artillery pieces that did not work, but for show, towed behind a truck, a lot of other motor vehicles and equipment, and we were to make a road march from Kalu to Quezon uh, to make it look like with this the fake message traffic that we were going to reoccupy the combat base at Quezon and then with the objective being that once the NVA would, would mass to get ready to attack the convoy on the road, that with uh, equipment they would find out where they were massing and then they would arc like them with B-52s. Uh, as we we're going down the road, we fooled absolutely no one. Uh, we received every night fire on the position where we were, we were on the road and you would have a tank in front, a tank in back of the column, the others with the guns pointed outboard, infantry on the top and bottom of the hill, and you just sit there. Um, we got to the, uh, the plateau, right at the base of the plateau at Quezon. Uh, finally, after, okay, what do you want us to do now? Uh, then the decision was, well, it didn't work, so go back home, and which we did. And it took us three days to get back home because you would, every morning, sweep the road to find the mines that had been planted that night, get rid of them, go down as far as you could until it got dark again, and then go through the same thing. Um, Let me ask you yeah. a, a question. What's a typical day like for a tank crew or for a tank, tank crew? Mission? I think uh, it, it all depends. If, if you were back in one of the major fire support bases, uh, the majority of the thing, it, we did an awful lot of indirect fire. And so you would ramp, you, you would cut a, 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 a trough, if you will, in the, in the ground. You would put your tank in that trough, and they would fire indirect fire for uh, H&I or uh, hat, you know, harassment introduction fires to, at lo known locations through intelligence where they thought the NVA were. So you would spend the majority of the day working on the tank to make sure it was uh, for any maintenance that it was, uh, you're taking care of it. So it was when you got these calls, as we would, as we did, uh, one in the afternoon that you had to make a major road march, the entire length of the, of the, the trafficable area in Vietnam, that you'd be able to do that, and you wouldn't lose vehicles along the way. Uh, the other would be uh, servicing the weapon, uh, getting ready, finding what uh, targets you were going to fire that night and then assign tanks to get in position to do so. Uh, if you were, uh, we basically would operate, we had the company rear was located at Vendai, which was near halfway between Camlo and Dong Ha. There you would have one platoon and you'd have your tank maintenance uh, heavy support area there that the company maintenance could do. And we had a, a great, uh, Maintenance chief, a guy named Harold Rinchy, uh, who would win the, earn the Navy Cross uh, for an ambush that he was in, involved in where they ambushed the tank retriever and where they were trying to recover a, a, a tank that had, uh, had a lot of mine damage. Uh, and he could do things uh, that were way above our authority level to do, and we did. Um, so you had this heavy emphasis to try to repair vehicles in, in the field in, as what we could do, what you couldn't do, you had to then to go through an, uh, an authorized evacuation channel back to uh, the high, uh, heavy maintenance units that were in the, in the rear in Quang Tri and Dong Ha. Um, we, would, we would then, on, on those other occasions, uh, when, if you're back there, you're, you're doing the typical things that Marines all you, you're preparing your position. Uh, you were getting ready for then security detail that evening, uh, and it was you know that sort of the day. You you mentioned mines several times. Yeah. What what was, how frequently did you uh, interact with? Mines? Um, we had we hit a lot of mines. Um, I think that in April, 
or May of 69, for example, uh, with my company, a Bravo company, which was 17 tanks, uh, on various operations that we were on, uh, one month we hit about 35 mines. Uh, one day I hit two mines. Uh, and what that would do is it would usually blow off sections of track. You would carry spare sections of track on the tank. You might damage a road wheel. You'd have to pull that up. Uh, so it, and then you'd reconnect uh, your, your tank or track section so you should be able to move. Uh, most times uh, what we found were they were using a, a plastic uh, East German anti-tank mine, which I do have pictures of and I'll send them to you. Um, and it was very hard to, uh, for the engineers to be able to detect those because they only had one or two pieces of metal. Right, at the side of your phone. Yeah. And um, so it, it, it was hard. Um, the other, they were using standard Soviet or uh, Chinese um, metal anti-tank mines. Um, but we did, uh, we had a, a lot of uh, mine damage. Uh, uh, they would, the VC or NVA, you'd look at areas, if you were operating in a field, they would know about, okay, where could you drive safely, and then you were gonna have mines. Uh, and it became just a, a normal, uh, that was another thing that you knew if you hit a mine, the rule of thumb was you had 15 minutes to make the necessary repairs to get out of where you were, because within 15 minutes you were going to receive artillery or mortar fire, because they would they would have FOs in the field that would be watching for you. Know, they would uh, then call back for fire missions, and you you better be. Uh, it's an incentive. Get them out in 15 minutes, or you were going to get far. Um, then uh, just trying to think what else. Um, I think as a whole, uh, my experience was that, um, contrary to some beliefs, that you could not use tanks effectively uh, in Vietnam. There were areas you could. There were absolutely areas as you got f farther west, um, south of the DMZ, you were not, I mean, the, the train was just not going to let you use them. But uh, in that area between GLN, Contian, Cam Lo, and Dong Ha, uh, that was very trafficable. You could use them a lot, and they were used. Did, did you ever run across NVA armor? No. Uh, what we what we found it was all uh, North Vietnamese regular infantry. Uh, I don't I don't recall. I do not recall in in my 13 months there that we ever were really um, engaging. The, what people would say the uh, the VC or the, Vic, or the Viet Cong, everyone that we were uh, engaging were primary were regular North Vietnamese infantry, uh, who were very good. Did you go on R and R? I did. Uh, we went like a lot of other people to Hawaii. Uh, Janice met me in Hawaii, and we. Uh, I mean, I, when I was, uh, I, I Da Nang. I was to Da Nang four times in my life. When I flew into country. When I flew out, when I went to Da Nang to catch the R and R flight, and when I flew back to Vietnam after R and R, uh, the rest of the time was all uh, up north. When in your tour did you go on R and R? Uh, I went in January. Um, I, I did right after um, I had come back to battalion, and then right before I would, was going because I knew I was going back uh, to be a company commander. In March. In March. So when did when did you finish your tour? Uh, in August of 1969. And you, you finished at battalion or? No, I finished. I was a CEO, uh, commanding officer of okay. B Company, out in the field. Uh, one story that that uh, is one of this. I I had set aside one set of utilities. It was the the best. You know, I mean, it was at least it was clean. Utilities, a field. A uniform. field uniform. Yeah. And I had a pair of boots that I purposely did not wear in the field. And so I, it was the best set of clothes that I own. And as I'm in, uh, a friend of mine was at uh, the MEF headquarters at, uh, in Da Nang. And he said, well, if you come, we'll go to the, the Navy Officers Club in Da Nang. And as I walked into the club, uh, one of the, the 
waiters or staff or something said, oh my, you know, my gosh, you, you, your uniform is terrible. And this uh, Marine colonel said, leave him alone he just, <laughs> and serve him whatever he wants. Just, you know, and so that was my story with the, it's It's all relative. It's all relative. Um, and I still have that uniform. And, and the boots that have, uh, don't ask me, I save things. Okay. Um, well, you're a story. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, as far as general impressions, um, I, I really, th I, I think that um, the, the, the biggest thing that, that has stayed with me uh, my entire life is that the average young Marine, enlisted Marine that, that we have worked with our entire lives, uh, there is no better person in the world in terms of people that are loyal, that will do anything as long as you do what you are supposed to do, and that is to make sure that you take care of them, that you leave them the best that you possibly can, uh, and do what's right by them, that they will do anything in the world for you. Um, the people that I met uh, in Vietnam, in combat, uh, there's no better people, and there are no better people in the world. Um, I think that um, it's awful easy to throw stones or criticize, uh, and it's usually by people that have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, the shock, I think, for me, though, was when I came home as to how much things had changed uh, in the United States. And um, I came back, and I was assigned to Marine Barracks at Alameda in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so that was a uh, uh, an interesting awakening when uh, when my job was to go to I, I was a guard I had a guard platoon at the barracks at Alameda which was a naval air station and uh, you would go occasionally to the uh, the court in Berkeley to uh, f if you had young Marines that would go to and get in trouble one way or the other and it was always very interesting showing up in uniform in Berkeley across from the campus of the University of California was... Uh, Good to meet new people. You, meet, you met some new and interesting people. Well, how long were you there? Uh, I was there about uh, a year and a half. And then um, as we were talking, coming down, I, I was thinking about getting out. Um, I had interviewed, in fact, with uh, a company that said they were going to give me a job, but I was going to be... Uh, working for Kaiser Cement and Gypsum in North and South Dakota and Montana. And then I said I had to think about that and talk with my wife. Came back and the next day the headquarters Marine Corps called and said, we're going to send you to Amphibious Warfare School early because the guy that was going to go is getting out and we need to fill this quota. And so I said, well, it sounds like a better deal than North Dakota and South Dakota and Montana. Uh, and so then... Uh, went back to uh, Amphibious Warfare School and stayed in 30 years. What, 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 where did you go after AWS? Uh, AWS uh, went, it was the Assistant uh, Inspector Instructor for 4th Tank Battalion that was located then at Camp, uh, at the old Camp Matthews, which had been one of the main Marine bases during World War II. Uh, the major when I first got there, uh, it was on near the Al uh, uh, Miramar Naval Air Station then. Uh, the majority of the buildings were, st the barrack buildings were still there uh, during the time that I was on, three years that I was on the staff. All of those buildings were torn down with the exception of the main uh, divisional headquarters building or base headquarters building, some of the warehouses, and then a, a, the tank park, which is at the very end of the, uh, uh, the, the divisional area or training camp area. Um, we still were using the pistol rangers. Uh, there was a lot, a fair amount of uh, area to run uh, basic driving tanks. For any tank gunnery, we would take the reservists to uh, Camp Pendleton 
and we kept five tanks there uh, for gunnery. And so during the weekend drills, uh, you, we always had someone going to Fort uh, uh, Camp Ellen for tank gunnery training. Um, was there for three years, uh, was then uh, went back to uh, Okinawa. Uh, initially, um, was uh, was uh, transferred from third tanks t on a t or a temporary additional duty status to go to division headquarters to be the OI officer in charge of the division command center for a three month period. We then became the staff secretary for Third uh, Marine Division. Uh, stayed there uh, working for chief of staff. Um, Explain the, what the duties of the staff secretary. Well, I was the guy that would prepare all the uh, messages for the general, for uh, the chief of staff, would the, all of the correspondence uh, would get that ready for him to sign. Uh, if you had various meetings, would prepare the meeting space. Uh, towards the end of that uh, period, was about th in the fourth month, was then for about a, a month, two months, was the aide um, aid de camp to the uh, commanding general of th uh, the headquarters of 3MAF. Uh, uh, then I had the greatest, uh, the general asked me what I wanted to do and I said I want to be a company, go back and uh, get a company again. And so my last four months I then went to Camp Fuji, Japan, again as the commanding officer of B Company. Uh, and our job was at Camp Fuji, which was the site of the Japanese tank school and artillery school, it had great ranges. We would uh, have the company headquarters um, in what we in North called North Camp Fuji, which were all old uh, Korean War, uh, end of World War II uh, barracks and buildings. Um, we would have then platoons from the battalion that would be sent to Camp Fuji, and we would provide tactical and training and gun uh, gun uh, training uh, for the tank crews. Um, great job. Was there a long ways from anybody bothering me? Uh, that was unaccompanied, right? Yeah, that was unaccompanied. Uh, that whole uh, tour uh, was unaccompanied. But did that for four months, so I had a chance to command the same company that I had commanded as a first lieutenant in combat to be able to have, uh, work with them again on mainland Japan. Um, came from there, uh, came back and was assigned as the Marine Liaison Officer at Fort Knox, which was the Army Armor School. And I was in uh, combat developments in the Armory Engineer Board, so research and development for both uh, equipment, materials, and then through the combat developments uh, hat, looking at new tactics, techniques, and employment techniques. Would then provide uh, every month a report back to the Marine Corps Development Center at Quantico. Uh, they would give a report if they were, for example, uh, one very big test was um, they were testing a, um, a mine rollers and uh, equipment that would be mounted on tanks that you're very familiar with. Um, and we, I would test that and then uh, make a report back on the status of what did it work, was it effective, was it something the Marine Corps wanted to get involved with. Um, Good tour? It was a great tour. Uh, I did that for two and a half years um, and then was assigned um, on a special program that was working um, a joint Army Marine Corps program looking at the development of light armored vehicles uh, and a high velocity um, telescope 75 millimeter round. Uh, we worked for, um, where well, the deal was that the Commandant said I will provide an officer, the Army said I'll provide one and we'll get a, a financial uh, guy to take care of the money, uh, an admin section, and then this, t these two majors initially, uh, one Army, one Marine, and they'll run this program that we were doing testing on a, a vehicle on the high survivability test weight test vehicle lightweight, which was a 21-ton tracked light tank. Uh, great vehicle, uh, I think would have been an extremely effective uh, item of equipment for both the Marine Corps and especially for light infantry and airborne forces, but um, it did not, was not brought into the inventory. Um, the 75 millimeter uh, high velocity round uh, was an extremely effective and it gave you much more penetration 
capability than a 75 millimeter gun would normally just because of the type of round. But uh, a factor of expense, a factor of another new piece of equipment, uh, it, it, it was not introduced. Where was this? Uh, it was at the Pentagon, okay. but the majority of the testing was done at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, at uh, uh, Fort Knox, uh, also we did some at Fort Bliss. Uh, so it was uh, trained using both either the gun or the vehicle, uh, a combination of training areas. So you, your desk was in D.C.? The desk was in D.C., the Which majority of the work. Was somewhere else. Yeah, I was in the Pentagon for three and a half, about three and a half years. Uh, we bought a house. We then uh, kept this house the entire rest of the time in the Marine Corps. We lived in it three times, and we rented it out three times. Um, but that was my first uh, headquarters tour uh, at the Pentagon, and then I had two subsequent headquarters tours at Headquarters Marine Corps. Um, after that, went to Command and Staff College. Well, I forgot, um, while I was at, at that program, the Marine Corps said we were going to send you to Georgetown and get a master's degree in political science, which I did. Um, and then that set up my very last tour in the Marine Corps, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but went to Command and Staff College, uh, then was assigned uh, to a First Division at Camp Penland. Uh, started out as the Assistant G4 Logistics Officer, and then became the Commanding Officer of First Tank Battalion, uh, which was uh, one of the greatest jobs of my life. Uh, to be able to be a battalion commander with 72 tanks and 72 tows, 1,200 men in a, in a unit was just an amazing uh, opportunity. Um, after uh, Camp Pillman then went back to Okinawa for another tour with, this time with 3MEF and was the G3, operation, or the G3 operations officer that followed after at, with 1st Division before I went to Okinawa. I was also the G3 operations officer for First Marine Division. So it, really some great jobs. Um, you, you did a tour in Japan. I did. That was later. Okay. And I'll, right. I'll mention right. that. Right. Um, after uh, then going back to, with a 3MEF tour, um, came back for another tour at Headquarters Marine Corps. It was then promoted to Colonel and went um, back to Japan to be the commanding officer of Marine Barracks Japan, which was the a consolidation of all the Marine, there were three Marine barracks uh, in Japan that fell under my uh, headquarters. We were located at Yokosuka, Japan, uh, and, and my wife was able to go with me, so Janice finally uh, had an overseas tour. Um, but it was a great, great assignment. Um, were your kids with you, or they were? No, uh, both of the children were in college. Uh, we had, my son was uh, going to school in California. Um, and he was in the PLC program. Um, my daughter was a freshman starting college when we were getting ready to leave. And one aside story is she told her mother, why are you so upset? Nothing can possibly happen. And she, um, Janice said, well, I'm going to be 10,000 miles or whatever it was, miles away if something happens. I'm not going to be able to get there immediately. And we were in Japan two weeks, and, and, and Sherry called on the phone and said, crying, said, I have been in a, in a car accident. Somebody hit me from behind. What do I do? And I said, well, Sherry, have you called USAA? And I'm giving a plug for USAA. And she said, no. And I said, call them, and they will tell you what to do. They will take care of you. And her mother then said, and I will be on the first plane back home, which she was. Uh, so it was an interesting life, uh, but it, uh, Sherry and, and Will would come uh, during, uh, well, Sherry and Will both for Christmas vacation, and we would, we spent one, one Christmas in Tokyo, one Christmas in Hong Kong. Uh, William was in PLC, so he was never there in the summer, Sherry was. Mm -hmm. uh, but then after that tour, um, I was assigned to be the chief of the Joint uh, Training and Doctrine Division and um, 
Exercise Division for the old U.S. Atlantic Command, was, which headquartered at Norfolk, Virginia, a joint tour, joint staff tour. Um, finished, uh, did three years there. Uh, the very last, I was, uh, in addition to those, the main job for about a uh, four-month period was the Deputy J-3 for the U.S. Atlantic Command. And then for the last year, in addition to be the Chief of uh, Exercise Division and, and Training and Doctrine uh, Development uh, was also the Chief of Special Operations Command. Uh, Navy Admiral that I worked for said, we're not getting a, a Special Forces Officer and you understand this stuff, so you do it. Uh, so, so I did. Um, after that, uh, received a phone call as I was thinking about getting out um, and retiring. I got a phone call that said, uh, we see that we paid for you to go to graduate school. You now owe us, so you're going to come back. And the chief uh, of uh, Marine Corps History Museums Division wants to have a historian, uh, somebody that understands history, and you're it. That best, uh, it was a great tour. Uh, probably one of the, the finest uh, bosses that I've ever had. Uh, Ed Simmons, who was a retired Marine general, uh, was the longtime head of the History Museums Division and just a fine, fine man. And where was that? That was at uh, the Washington Navy Yard was the headquarters and the museum division was at Quantico and old buildings uh, that were near OCS. Um, did that for about two and a half years and a friend from Norfolk that was doing research in the facility said uh, they're looking for a uh, uh, director of the MacArthur Memorial, you ought to put your name in. So I did, uh, was offered the job, put on my papers to retire, and then have been uh, 24 years working either as the director of the MacArthur Memorial Museum and Archive and Library and the, uh, for, and the executive director of the General Douglas MacArthur Foundation, and two years ago retired, or three years ago, retired from the uh, museum job. Uh, but have uh, continued as the executive director of the MacArthur Foundation, which has been uh, a, a great second career, great life. Uh, I just forgot what I was going to ask. Well, tell us more about your family. Well, um, we had two children, uh, William, who, um, who later went and uh, received a PhD at the University of Virginia, uh, works for the university now in uh, what he does. I have no idea and so he, he it is about Using computers to develop interactive learning for whatever field you need it, He can design will design Programs all the way from he currently is working with the university to design is there having a new uh, HR uh, Office rollout po program policies and he's designing these interactive learning programs to be able to train both the HR staff and all of the employees within the University of Virginia system about the new HR system to uh, a, lot, a number of programs that he developed for the AMA on programs to train uh, emergency room nurses, technicians, for their normal certification to take the class online that would be able to do that. His wife, Kirsty, works for the university also is the head of uh, all of the environmental and uh, job-related technical, uh, like uh, technicians. Uh, if you have a problem with range hoods that, that's not doing what it's supposed to do, Christy knows more about that than anybody I know of. Uh, they have two sons. Um, Miles, the oldest, uh, graduated from University of Mary Washington. Uh, he's now in 8th of September, the Saturday, reports to Quantico to uh, go through OCS. Uh, his brother, uh, Ian, is a junior at the University of Virginia. Um, my daughter, Cheryl, lives in... Uh, uh, Norfolk with us, or close to us, about a mile away. She has three girls. Uh, one is, uh, Emma's a uh, sophomore in high school. 
Kathleen is a in the sixth grade, and Noel is in the eighth grade, uh, and they are the joy of their grandfather's life. Uh, Let me. Yeah. You have had occasion to travel quite a bit in mm -hmm. in, uh, in your with your duties with the MacArthur Foundation. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, one of the things that, that uh, we are the, at, at, in Norfolk, the MacArthur Foundation and the MacArthur Memorial are the, the place where General and Mrs. MacArthur are buried. So it is a, uh, within the rotunda of the memorial. Uh, it's also a working museum. Uh, we also have then a visitor center, a uh, new one that we just finished uh, construction in 2012. Um, and we have a, a working archive library and research center, have all of General MacArthur's papers, uh, most of the papers of all of his key flag officers, uh, about a quarter of a million photographs. Um, it is a uh, two and a half million documents. Uh, it's where we, see, as, as uh, you would know, uh, in archives, uh, we are lucky in that we are receiving something from a family somewhere in the United States just about every week. And so we, like other archives, have the, the responsibility to take this body of knowledge that tells us about our history, our legacy, our heritage, and to make sure that it is preserved, that it is protected, that it is available for students and scholars and researchers and family members that want to learn what a loved one may have done someplace in the Pacific or in World War I. Um, we've been, we have been getting uh, a lot of um, materials uh, lately, um, World War II and Korean War, as those veterans are passing, families then are entrusting to us this information, which can range from two or three photographs to, um, uh, we had uh, last year a uh, supporter that donated his personal library, which was about 8,000 books that covered American history from the French and Indian War to the present. And so it's, you know, you get that that degree of, uh, of things. And it, uh, so we have a very active uh, educational program uh, this, in the uh, deed of gift between General MacArthur and the city of Norfolk, he agreed to give all of his, his papers, mem memorabilia, belongings, and the city said, we will take what was the old Norfolk City Hall, convert that to a museum, and then with a private-public partnership between the memorial, the city of Norfolk, and the General Douglas MacArthur Foundation, we have raised the monies to build uh, the research center, the library, the education center, the new visitor center, uh, and to maintain uh, the, uh, uh, the the artifacts through conservation programs, uh, also to provide monies to the educator uh, to conduct educational programs, uh, to the archivist to maintain services, uh, for someone coming in and using the library archives, and then to uh, the curator who's putting on, maintaining the permanent exhibits, but also uh, putting on special exhibits. Uh, one of the, the provisions of the will of MacArthur with the city of Norfolk was that we had to be a center for active scholarship and it had to be free of charge to the public. And so that made then the job, uh, and the city then said, and we will agree to maintain the buildings, to maintain a working staff in perpetuity. The foundation says, and we will agree to provide capital campaign funds to bring new exhibits or to construct new exhibit areas, new buildings as needed and required, um, and then to support the curator, the educator, and the archivist to actually provide the services to the people. Uh, and I think it's been uh, uh, an extremely good partnership. Um, the city has been very good to the memorial. Uh, it has, I think, probably a very small but an extremely dedicated staff, a very knowledgeable staff, and an extremely dedicated staff. Uh, the other thing that we do 
in addition to providing support for the MacArthur Memorial, is we provide uh, awards to the active army, the National Guard, the reserves, the joint forces that will recognize outstanding leadership in junior officers, captains, lieutenants, majors. Um, we also provide writing awards to the Joint Forces Staff College in Norfolk, the Army Command General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, uh, outstanding uh, cadet awards to military schools and colleges throughout the United States and the Royal Military College in Canada, uh, as well then as awards that go to recognize outstanding leadership for the Army Cadet Command to all the best uh, university ROTC, Army ROTC units throughout the United States, and we provide uh, outstanding junior Army ROTC uh, cadet awards for about um, uh, 160 of the best selected uh, throughout the United States. So it, it is uh, multifaceted, uh, but the main thing is to, uh, I think both organizations, is to ensure that the legacy, the history, the heritage of those that have gone before us is passed on to future generations of Americans and that we are having to be a place where the story of those that served in the American Civil War through uh, the current day that is maintained and kept as a, a, a place where people can come and learn about their history, much like you all are doing. But um, you also have uh, some international connections. We, we work do a lot with, uh, well, for example, I, we just got back, uh, we dedicated a plaque uh, in July, on the, on the 25th of July, at uh, the Cote de Chatelon, which was a battle that the 42nd Infantry Division, the Rainbow Division, that MacArthur uh, came up with the idea, convinced Woodrow Wilson to take National Guardsmen and National Guard units from 26 states in the District of Columbia and make them an integral unit in, in and of themselves, rather than use them as individual replacements in regular Army divisions. Uh, he became then the chief of staff of that division, was promoted to Brigadier General, would command the 84th Infantry Brigade at this battle and others, uh, and we dedicated this, this uh, plaque in France uh, to commemorate that action. Uh, we also have deep ties with the Republic of the Philippines, with the Republic of Korea, um, those places where MacArthur was assigned had a role uh, and in all of those, as, as you know, uh, MacArthur had a career that spanned a 52-year period and was uh, probably was a man that had feet of clay like everyone. Uh, he made mistakes, but he did an awful lot of things right. Uh, and I think, in my opinion, the thing that he's going to be most remembered for is not what he did as a soldier on the battlefield, but rather what he did in Japan where he introduced for the first time in the history of the Japanese people uh, democratic institutions both in their own civilian lives and their own government so that they had a stake in their own lives. They had a stake in their own government. Uh, you had universal suffrage. You had uh, the right to own property other than, you know, before it was the feudal lords that owned the property. Now, the, the average person, if they worked the land or worked that area, you could own part of that. Uh, so I think that's what he's going to be, I believe, what he's going to be best known for. And, and the great, I think what he also in his writing said that his hope was that he would be recognized for that, of serving uh, people, of serving humanity. And I think the idea of uh, the policies that he introduced uh, in Japan during the occupation forged this great relationship that we have had since 1945 with the people in the government of Japan. Um, so I think that's really key. Um, the other thing is, you know, we, we, we try to do uh, things that, that keep this story alive, uh, not only about General MacArthur, but I think more importantly about all Americans who served during that period so that the story about what a young man that may have been from Alabama or Iowa did as part of the 84th Infantry Brigade is not going to be lost 
but it's going to be passed down. And I think with working with the, the uh, Rainbow Division Veterans Foundation, uh, we've been able to do that. And with other organizations, uh, we have been able to do that. Uh, so we do a lot uh, to support veterans organizations locally in Norfolk and Hampton Roads, but uh, also uh, to work with other foundations, other institutions, to make sure that we're not going to lose sight of our history. It sounds like a version of the Veterans History Project. I think so. I, th I think so. We, we do do some oral histories at the memorial, but not to the extent that you all do. And I think um, I, anything, anyone that, we, that can be doing these things, it's absolutely essential uh, because we, we, we need to know what our forebears did for us and for the nation. Um, and I think it's, it's really important uh, because we can sometimes forget too easy. Great story. Ah. Just, just one final part here. What we do is we offer the, uh, the interviewee the opportunity to editorialize, to just speak their mind about whatever they wish, any topic at all. And you don't have to, but I mean, you're, you're welcome to do it as a closing statement. Um, I guess, you know, if I look back on um, 30 years in the Marine Corps, uh, 25, 26 years working uh, for the MacArthur Memorial and, and the Foundation, uh, I have been extremely lucky. Uh, I have been able in, to do what, what my passion has been and is, and that is history and service to our country. Uh, and I've been very lucky. And I think both um, have given me the opportunity to do that. Um, I, th you know, I am extremely, uh, also extremely proud of my, uh, my children, now my grandson, that's going to uh, continue the, the, the legacy of his father and, and friends like you and others. Um, and I, I, I guess that I would hope that we as a people would continue to remember, I mean, you don't have to agree with them, you don't have to agree with me, you don't have to agree with others, but that you would understand and say, okay, I understand what this person did, and he did what he thought or she did, uh, what they thought were, were right, and I'm not going to fault them for that. I may disagree with what they did, but I would hope that uh, across the board that, that we would return to a degree of civility that would make it okay to disagree with someone. But we need to talk through things. And um, I think it's important we remember things too. And the only way we're going to do that is to sit down and um, you don't have to have a, you, you just have to be able to listen. And maybe if we did that, and I'm as, uh, as my wife will tell you, sometimes I don't listen as I should, but uh, we got to do something like that. Um, and and we, we, we've, we really need, we need to because it's, um, Shouting at one another is not solving the problem. Thank you. Great story. Uh, thank you for participating and thank you for your service. It's Thanks, been, It's been good knowing you. Thank you. So Thanks. Much.